Welcome to the webinar, Promoting Adherence and Health Behavior of Change. I'm Barbara Lewis. Thank you for joining us. This webinar will last about 30 minutes. And if you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A or the chat. And if we don't have a chance to get to your question during the webinar, we will respond afterwards. So before we get started, let me talk briefly about .com. .com is an online interactive communication uh, system, learning system. And uh, we have outstanding faculty who have actually put together all of the modules. They are leading faculty from around the country, actually from around the world. Next slide. And um, it uh, has 42 modules that is very interactive, over 400 videos, and some of which are annotated. And our, any surveys that we've done, the, both the faculty and the students love the videos. So we have a whole back end as well that you can take a look at. We've had over 300 institutions subscribe to .com, over 100,000 subscribers, and we've been translated into three languages. And we've had 10 journal articles about .com. And you can find those journal articles on the website. And here are a couple of um, the different studies that have been done. .com also has a sister platform, and we have 12 professional formation modules that um, are used by many people right now in professionalism. We also have two faculty modules in facu and that include faculty development and remediation. But let's get right to our presentation today. And let me introduce to you Dr. Christy Letford, who is a professor of family medicine and research director in the Department of Family Medicine and the Curtis G. Hames, MD, distinguished chair for the Department of Family Medicine at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University. And Dr. Dana Wynn is a colonel in the US Marine Corps and she's in her uniform today. Right, <laughs> that is your uniform, okay. And she is associate professor and chair of the Department of Family Medicine at the Uniform Services University. So Christy, go ahead and take it away and welcome. Thank you, I'll speak up for Dana. She's in the army. I don't wanna insult her by having anyone think she's a Marine. <laughs> That'd be cool if I was a Marine. <laughs> So we're excited to spend some time with you this afternoon or morning, depending where you are. Um, I'm here as an expert in clinician patient communication and as a researcher, and I'm privileged to be presenting alongside Dana Nguyen, who's been a collaborator, colleague, and a friend for about seven years now. And it's a talented family physician that she absolutely brings in not only a research perspective, but a true clinical view. So as we talk about behavior change today, we do have this set of learning objectives. I wanna be clear that we're not only talking about behavior change, but behavior adoption. We'll talk a little bit about the nuance of that. We do have these very specific learning objectives for you today, but the bottom line is we're here to help you conduct collaborative goal setting with your patients. And specifically, we want you to walk away from this 30 minutes with some actionable practice recommendations. Uh, my goal in spending time with not just researchers, but with clinicians is that your practice in this afternoon's clinic can be different. So I'm sure some of you will see patients today. And I think that some of the things we talk about may improve patient care in the next hour, potentially. Uh, I do want to say that as we're talking through today, we, Dana and I have picked uh, chosen a very specific context to situate our conversation, and that is in the context of flu vaccination. We chose this because this is a conversation we know most of you will be having this month. This is very contemporary. This is very relevant. I don't know how many of you uh, read your up-to-date or Medscape emails yesterday to see that there's a new poll out showing patient reluctance to uptake the bivalent COVID booster and the flu vaccine together. We're now showing only about 48% of Americans are open to that, and that's a concern. So it's definitely something you're going to be hearing in the clinic soon, if you haven't already. Um, we want to recognize that this is a little bit different conversation than the classic behavior change conversation that usually talks about smoking cessation or physical activity. But we really want to work through this and help you conceptualize flu vaccine as a repeated behavior. This is not just a behavior that people do once. We want people to continue doing this each year. And so we'll talk about that. 
We also, um, as we talk through, you'll hear me say a couple of comparisons to birth control methods and specifically birth control, how we talk about quarterly or annual administration of some of those, how this conversation will be similar. There are three key principles underlining um, our talk today. One is we do recognize that there are patients who seem unwilling or unable, and that's part of our uh, intent today is to give you some skills to talk with patients to help move them past that. We do know that research shows that patients can successfully change their behavior or adopt it. Um, I want to call your attention to word brief here. Dana is a family physician. Uh, I know she practices in a system where there are 15 to 20 minute templated appointments, which means about seven to nine uh, minutes of FaceTime with her or with a physician. We are very respectful that we are not giving you um, skills today that are going to extend your clinic time. Our intent is for this to fit in your normal clinic practice. We also know that clinicians who counsel effectively about behavior change use specific assessment and advising skills. So that's what we're really focusing on today is the skill level with y'all. So first of all, we just want to recognize all the elephants in the room <laughs> and that there are barriers to behavior change counseling, especially in the primary care setting uh, where Dana practices and where I'm a researcher and also um, a department leader. Um, consistently, we hear there's just not enough time and visits for this. Um, we do hear our clinicians talk about how they don't have these skills. That's one of the intents of this time today is to give you some training on this. Um, clinicians do get frustrated with patients who seem unready to change, um, but also, and this is one of the topics I talk a lot about with my learners, both medical students and residents, this question of how comfortable is a clinician about giving up control over the goals or options, um, and how comfortable can you be with a less than perfect plan? When you're doing your assessment and plan, how much can you take a step back and say, I have the perfect plan, but actually the perfect plan is the one the patient can enact and what does that look like? Uh, also that a lot of barriers have to do with difficulty appreciating a patient perspective and then the emotion that in encounters or you engage with in that encounter is expressing empathy when the patient becomes defensive. So the skill set we're going to talk about today is the five A's framework. Uh, there are five of them, five A's, assess, advise, agree, assist, and arrange. They are informed by four different theory sets. For those of you who are theory driven, we aren't going to focus on this today, but we want to make sure you have this in your toolbox to know that I think the topics we'll be talking about are informed by social cognitive, self-determination, the trans theoretical and the motivational interviewing. So to get started, the first step is assess. And when we talk about assessment, this is the most complex of the five A's because there are actually three different assessments that we recommend physicians and clinicians make. <clears throat> the first is patient understanding of the reason for change or adoption, that you can't make the assumption that patients know or that they understand the why for the recommendation. And you need to get to this before you can get any farther in that conversation. Second, you need to have a conversation and an assessment of the patient understanding of the target behavior. Uh, specifically, you know, in health behavior change work, we think about is it cessation of risky behaviors or is it adoption of healthy behaviors and how does the patient understand that? Because certainly cessation and adoption have different conceptualizations and how we would address them. And then third, you want to do an assessment of the patient's values, beliefs, and attitudes. And this is where not only goals of care, but the actual belief system and value system between a patient and a physician or clinician is important. We need to recognize that they can be divergent. Sometimes they can be conflicting. And to have this conversation at the onset will help guide the conversation later. You also need to assess readiness for change. So this is the stages of change framework. And generally, when we talk about pre-contemplation, contemplation and preparation, those are the stages through which we try to help motivate patients to move toward change. And we're gonna talk about some very specifics of contemplation and preparation in a minute. <clears throat> But we want to focus today on those two specifically because 
we're really working with patients who can take action within the next month. Lastly, we wanna talk about assessment in terms of two specific conceptual domains when it comes to thinking about the target behavior and that's conviction and confidence. And this probably looks familiar to a lot of you who have incorporated motivational interviewing into your practice. And these are these questions where you talk to the patient about are they convinced that it is important for them to enact the behavior and are they confident that they can do so. Once you have this assessment in, in partnership with the assessment of readiness for change and of the patient understanding, it helps you inform the next stage. So Dana, share with us some specific tips about the assess step. Sure, and thanks for the awesome comments. Uh, it's also a pleasure to uh, be Christy's colleague for, for so many years and be given the opportunity to, uh, to talk in this context. So um, thanks for outlining for us what uh, it takes to be successful in the assess phase of the five A's. So I'm a clinician and a teacher, and, and my goal is to bring some practical application to our conversation today. So on many of these slides, you'll see the ask, tell, ask a technique, and, and so we'll frame each of the 5A steps um, with that. And so first of all, before we get into anything, I do want to point out um, that one of the main components of the ask, tell, ask technique, if you just look you know, at the slide in front of you, it might be obvious, but it's a back and forth dialogue between the patient and the provider. Um, you know, we're moving away from uh, a patriarchal uh, information giving and really emphasizing here that even if in this assess step, it's a give and take and it's a conversation with the patient. So I'm a teaching faculty in my normal job um, and PS, I love the dot-com uh, modules uh, for teaching um, to both emphasize and demonstrate a lot of specific communication techniques uh, in, in healthcare. And um, in my teaching, I really emphasize this assess step as one of the, the most important places to start with a patient. And most of the time I'm teaching uh, medical student level learners where they're at the beginning stages of their careers and just learning uh, how to talk to patients. But I really emphasize this assess step when performing shared decision making in any health management um, or, or intervention plan. Um, you know, think in mind that when we see patients, um, there's some type of action usually required at the end. And so we're not, you know, specifically narrowed down to behavior changes in the patients, but also as Christy alluded to compliance with health plans um, and whatnot. And so um, Christy already mentioned that we're gonna just use an example of immunizations today, specifically the flu immuniz immunization. This also has a recency in my life as uh, I went last night, my, my 10 year old daughter uh, strongly encouraged me to go get my flu shot uh, with her last night um, because her motivation was that um, I got the flu last year and made the whole family sick and she didn't want to make the whole family sick again. So in practical application of this assess step, um, for example, in a lot of wellness visits, I might lead um, in the office with a statement about something like, how do you feel about your child getting his 12 month vaccines today? Or in the case of the flu shot, how do you feel about getting your flu shot in the office today? These are really good open ended questions that Christy already highlighted um, that we should use in this process. And they're really not tainted in judgment. We're um, just asking from really a place of humility and curiosity, hey, where, where does the patient stand? And I've really adopted this practice in, in almost all of, of my office visits. And then after that, after the hopefully the patient shares a little bit of information, we can follow up with supportive statements that demonstrate listening, that you're listening to the patient. And so many of my patients might say, yes, please, like, give me the shots. <laughs> no problem. Um, we're done there. Then you don't need any of the rest of this conversation. But that's that's not always the case. Uh, Christy told us today probably half of our patients are not uh, appropriately immunized uh, with the flu. So um, if if you want to affect those patients and that's where we're going to continue uh, from here. But um, when you're listening to the patients, concerns, it's helpful to reflect back to the patient, the patient perspective. I like to use uh, terms like it seems like you're worried about whatever, or it seems like you might not have time for whatever. 
I do personally try and avoid any form of using I understand um, because that can be off-putting to some patients thinking like, no, you really have not had my exact life experiences, <laughs> so you don't understand. So again, I like to lead with, you know, it seems like you might be frustrated or angry or tired or busy or whatever the, the emotion is um, or the behavior reaction that the patient expressed. And the rest of this assess, assess step should be focused on exploring the patient's uh, barriers to action, whatever that action is, with curiosity, without judgment, and also with the emphasis that, that ultimately that the choice is theirs. So as we move to step two, I do want to iterate or um, emphasize that this is sometimes iterative. I don't want you to see one, two, three, four, five, and think I do step one, and then I do step two, and then I do step three. I think one of the things Dana just alluded to is sometimes it's one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, <laughs> um, one, two, three, two, three, two, so that there is part of a conversation here. I think the more rigid you try to make it, the more one artificial it will seem, the two less tailored it can be. So the more tailoring of the conversation, the more this um, process will actually become a back and forth or iterative process rather than a truly a prepotent uh, stepped process. But the second step is to advise. There are two very important parts here. And one is to ask permission before giving advice. And this is uncomfortable for some physicians because and clinicians because they perceive that a patient has come to them for advice. I think uh, historically that was probably more true than it is now. Sometimes our patients are coming to us for something other than advice. And that's important for us to recognize now. But especially when you are recommending a behavior change or a behavior adoption that may be not their reason for visit. So for instance, if they're here today because they've been having headaches and you start a new conversation about a new preventive or a new health behavior change, you are saying to them, can we talk about something else today? So it's important that you ask permission before giving this new advice. And then you make it brief. <laughs> so this is not just an honor of your own time management, but it's also communicating to a patient that you are honoring their time management. And this is where you're very specific about what the target behavior change you're starting to explore is. So this goes a little bit with what Dana had asked her patient about how do you feel about. This is a similar way to be a little open-ended, but also you're just probing. So as your doctor, I have some information about how the flu vaccine can affect your health. Would you be interested in hearing about this? So that this phase or step does have uh, not just an ask, but then a brief offer. So Dana's gonna give us some tips about that. Yeah, so when you enter this advise phase of the conversation, I personally um, recommend, especially to students or residents to approach your primary role as the information chair, the advisor, or the coach. Uh, I'm a coach in a lot of other things uh, in life, so I like to relate a lot of things uh, back to that. Really, the last thing that patients want is what I call a patriarchal diatribe about, is in this case, how the body mutes and immu uh, mounts an immunologic response to the vaccine. Um, most patients either, one, don't care, uh, two, won't remember what you have to say, or three, won't understand any of these uh, technical terms. And in fact, any type of, quote, mini lecture to the patient is not likely to address the patient-specific Worriers, worries or barriers um, that ultimately need to be addressed in order to get the patient to adopt the change um, or the advice that we want. So in this advice phase, I like leading with something like, so for a vaccine example, can I answer any questions you have about vaccines or vaccines today? Or is it okay if I share some brief information about the benefits and risk and or risks of the vaccine? And by asking that permission, as Christy alluded to, um, th these questions really ensure that the patient's open to hearing whatever I have to say. And then I can target the information that I'm sharing back based on the needs and the concerns of the patient that's specific to the patient. Um, I also would advise that you really um, ensure that you're still tending to the patient's um, emotions and reactions here. I tell uh, our medical students that medical uh, communication is like good 
improv that we as providers usually have a bit of an agenda for what the information that we need to gather and the things that we need to do during a visit. But just as importantly, we're not really effective unless we can really in the moment assess the responses and the reactions of our patient, be able to hear those and then respond appropriately and advise them in the direction that they need, not necessarily the direction that that I need to drive. Thank you. So as we move into step three, it really, you know, gets to this point of you've gone far enough in this conversation where you're moving toward making a plan. You've gone past this assess and advise, and you're really wanting to move toward agreement. The overall goal here is to really empower the patient. Uh, you're giving them advice. You are giving them knowledge for behavior change or behavior adoption that ultimately is dependent on them, not on you. So empowering them is very important. And that this is really a collaborative process that you're trying to foster in the encounter. Now, Dana and I are both in family medicine, so I'd be reticent not to say here that the key to this is probably a continuous relationship with a primary care physician where you already have trust between the clinician and the patient but we recognize that's not always the context in which this happens. But because of that, we need to constantly be reminding ourselves about collaboration. And so that there are four steps here. One, you wanna be proposing a small step, trying to agree on a measurable goal, but also that it's realistic. And that does not mean realistic for you, the clinician, that's realistic in the context of the patient's life. And that ultimately you're going to be encouraging autonomy by supporting the patient's choices. So even if they start to push back and say they want a different goal than you originally started talking them through, that you then boost their autonomy because that is predictive of their success. Dana, what are some actionable tips for the agree step? Yeah, again, I mean, you already emphasized the relationship portion. I mean, obviously certain parts of our healthcare system um, you know, our you know, episodic care, so either acute care or, or specialty care, but in the time where we can have longitudinal relationships, longitudinal care settings, primary care settings, those pre-existing relationships go a lot way, a, a long way to, to facilitating that open back and forth and dialogue between you and the patient. So using the ask, tell, ask technique again, especially and during this agree phase, um, we're using that back and forth dialogue to determine different courses of action uh, for the patient. And in this, in this example with the flu vaccine, you might think, oh, this, this is a binary action that either the patient gets the flu vaccine or they don't. And in fact, just like many things in medicine, there are a lot of different possibilities and a lot of different uh, things to consider. Um, it's rarely, rarely, rarely binary. So for example, Christy alluded to um, before, one of the ones that's come up recently is should I get the flu shot on the same day as my COVID booster or should I get them on different days? And if I get them on different days, which one should I get first? Or should I get my flu shot now or closer to the when we think the peak of the flu season is going to be? Or should I go to the community and go to Walgreens or CVS and get my shot now? Or should I wait until you have it here in my doctor's office? These are a lot of different decisions and there may be um, barriers for different patients, different types of barriers to uh, for how to have them enact. And so um, you can see that many of these options have barriers or worries from the patient, and it gives you a chance in that back and forth dialogue to clarify what those are for the patient. For example, if I don't, if my patient doesn't have a car, then, you know, that may limit one of the options uh, or another. If my patient's um, parent just died of COVID, then that may influence uh, their motivations for uh, one course of action versus the other. And so hopefully you've already explored the patient's barriers and concerns so that you can offer courses of action that are acceptable to the patient and that they're in line with their readiness levels. Um, sometimes the best course of action is not feasible. And um, as Chris, I think Christy mentioned that before or earlier. And in those circumstances, I might say, honestly, something like I said this last week, I can't remember what the topic was with one of my patients. I think the best course of action is X, but after discussing this with you, that action's really not feasible at this time. So that leaves us with B or C, you know, let's talk through those. 
And um, that's a pretty common conversation, honestly, that I have once I get a sense of the, the patient's concerns or, or barriers to care or decision making. Christy? Yeah, that's an excellent example, Dana. And I especially appreciate that because that's also communicating to the patient that you're hearing them. That when you acknowledge verbally out loud, like legitimately, I thought we were gonna do something else, but now I hear that that won't work. That's not just supporting their autonomy, but that really is um, showing that you're listening and engaging in collaborative decisions. So then we get to uh, this next step to assist. This was really getting into some of the details that Dana was talking about, which is the strategy. <laughs> How am I actually going to do this? Um, and you know, we intentionally chose flu vaccination today because this is one that traditionally we thought was a pretty easy behavior. <laughs> <laughs> but is increasingly becoming more difficult. So when we talk through how do you assist a patient in developing a strategy, identifying those barriers, and then helping them overcome them, are you walking through the patient's perspective and not yours? Where you think flu vaccine, no big deal. That will be easy. <laughs> you have to be careful not to have those biases. So Dana, what are some recommendations as this specifically within the stages of change for this? So with this um, assist portion of the five A's, I honestly tie this back to the three A's that we've already addressed. And a lot of those points that I've made are really emphasized in this assist phase. I think here, you know, a provider just needs to take into, cons into consideration that we really need to understand where the patient is with regard to making a decision or readiness for change. And so, um, you know, we highlighted two steps here. A patient may be ambivalent about um, making a change, for example, may say, you know, I've never gotten the flu shot. I don't see a reason to get it this year. Or they may be ready for action, you know, and say, hey, oh man, I, I got, I didn't get the flu or I didn't get the flu shot last year, but I got the flu. And so I am ready to get it this year, um, but I still have worries that I want to address. And so you are going to have that back and forth, ask, tell, ask dialogue during this assist phase, almost during the other three stages that we already talked about. Yeah, and that really does, especially when you take that assessment, even at this stage, and you connect it back, it's important even as you look forward to the arrange step. So this is, you know, classical arrangement, you talk through next steps, you consult or put in consults or referral appointments, sometimes you help them with education classes, or social support groups, these are very broad. But as Dana, as I talk, Dana and I talked about flu vaccines and even the bivalent, we really talked about how that's changing and how that's different when we think about arranging. Um, and then sure enough, this morning, my hospital system put out the email for the very specific steps that we're having to go through for these. Uh, specifically, I'm sure you're all aware in your own practices of now the requirement from the CDC that you have to have completed a booster series and have evidence of it before you can get the bivalent. And now we have to have signed attestation forms if patients don't show up with their cards. And so you know, those are steps and details that a lot of clinicians get very frustrated with and I'll be honest, get angry about because they're barriers. We also need to recognize the patients understand those as barriers too. And so needing to work with them and help them with these arrangements, helping them be prepared for when they get to a vaccine line, what do they need? Make sure they don't show up at a vaccine line and they don't know what they're going to need when they get there. So to wrap up, Dana's going to just challenge you with some clinical application points for today. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, hopefully we gave a, a few good examples of things that you can say or, or do to um, be more successful uh, in your clinic and sort of partnering with patients for their overall uh, success uh, in their health. So I think one of the big takeaways uh, for, for me is, you know, is to just try and sort of, you know, vision yourself as a coach right and, and and in that role be a supporter and um think about um one thing or one action that you need to take in your in your next patient that you see with their action plan and start by start with the first step just start with assess i think we take that for granted a lot and um simply starting with an assessment uh question are you ready or how do you feel about x y or z 
really is the start of the conversation that you need to have regardless of what the behavior or uh, change or the decision uh, needs to be, the action, whatever that action needs to be. Um, also, I want to um, emphasize the back and forth dialogue. Um, perhaps um, just do a self-assessment this afternoon in clinic and, and sort of see once you get to that decision making step. Um, if you find yourself talking to the patient more than back and forth with the patient. If you're able to self-identify that you're talking to more than with, then it's probably um, worth it to um, review the material and, and, and do some practice um, with folks that you might be comfortable with in, in using some of these questions and tools that I've demonstrated. And then finally, um, be curious. I, I think that, you know, sometimes we are worried about how short our patient visits are and how much time we have. And that curiosity can, you know, derail uh, our, our visits, but really being able to quickly at the beginning of the encounter address the patient's beliefs, behaviors, barriers, we're able to be more efficient throughout the rest of the encounter than if we go about it the opposite way. Yeah, and I, I think that's great. And I want to leave you with that. Dana's charge to be curious and also to be humble that those seem to be the key points for starting these conversations. Well, this was very educational. The ask, tell, ask is certainly a great technique. Thank you to Dr. Christy Ledford and Dr. Dana Wen and to everyone who has joined us today. The recording in the PowerPoint will be on the .com YouTube channel shortly. And please contact me if you'd like a trial subscription to .com, no credit card necessary, or if you'd like a free subscription to Professional Formation. Thank you for joining us today.